What up, AOK okay, Mafia? It's your boy Artie that kicks it just like that. We back with another one. <laughs> the case of Heather Elvis. Let's find out about it. Link to the original will be down in the description box below. Without further ado, y'all boys guys ready? I'm ready. It's a long one. Let's go. Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the solved, kind of, not really though, more unsolved, disappearance of Heather Elvis. Okay. Heather Elvis went missing on the early morning of December 18th, 2013 in South Carolina. Leading up to her disappearance, she was having an affair with a married man, Sidney Moore, but the relationship ended a couple of months before she went missing. And uh, when Sidney's wife found out, Oof. Sydney's wife, Tammy Moore, man, she's a crazy person. And the day Heather went missing, she was due to meet up with Sydney. That might be why he uh, was cheating on the woman, because she's crazy. In this case, there is some very interesting footage, interviews, and texts. So, let's hit the bricks. Heather Rachel Elvis was born on June 24th, 1993, in Horry County, South Carolina. Growing up, she was uh, generally a very artsy person, as we'll see from her Twitter, and um, honestly, just generally a people person. After graduating high school in 2011, she worked as a waitress at the Tilted Kilt in Myrtle Beach, and also the House of Blues in North Myrtle Beach, while studying cosmetology. And she moved into an apartment in Carolina Forest, with her roommate, Brianna Warlman, who also worked at the Tilted Kilt. So the trouble starts in June 2013 when uh, Heather was working at the Tilted Kilt in Myrtle Beach when a man by the name of Sidney Moore comes in to repair some of the uh, bollocks uh, kitchen equipment. Sidney was a Myrtle Beach native who owned his own business called Palmetto Maintenance, which provided maintenance and repair services on industrial equipment at restaurants in the area. Now fascinating, fascinating. That's the name. I don't, uh, I, I can't say, but interesting. Now he was 18 years older than Heather. He was 38 at the time, but he, he was 38, so that means she was only like 18, right? Or 20? 20. It seems that Heather, she had a bit of a taste for the older man, and in fairness, even though Sydney was married, his wife seemed like a real bitch. Anyway, according to her Twitter, Heather was, she was real smitten with him from the very get-go, uh, though she uses different language. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. I've never received this type of energy. Lucky guy. <laughs> they begin flirting and unsurprisingly it escalates into something more serious as the weeks go by. I'm sure. Whoa. Yeah, so I... Was, was that a picture of him and his wife? And As the weeks go by, the affair seems to heat up. Um, they weren't exactly hush-hush about the entire thing. Sydney would pop by uh, when Heather was working, bringing bagels and coffee. He even talked to his friends about bringing her on as a nanny for Sydney and Tammy's kids. However... By mid-September, it seems that the relationship came to a close. Ooh, cringe. But it didn't end there, because in October, uh, Sydney's wife, Tammy, she learns a little sum-sum. I'm actually genuinely surprised it took her 
uh, this long to learn about the affair because Sydney and Heather were not keeping it hush hush like at all. So Tammy, when she learns of this, she loses the rag and begins harassing the shit out of Heather. She forced Sydney to call Heather while she listened in and bashed her. Heather's roommate Brianna was there for the call and he reportedly said such things as she was nothing to him, just someone who spread their legs. Lovely stuff. Tammy would also send Heather texts and pictures of herself and Sydney having sex. Oof, nobody needs to see that, come on. Tammy would password protect Sydney's phone, so only she could use it. She handcuffed him to the couple's bed every night and accompanied him wherever he went outside the house. Tammy also made Sydney get her name tattooed on his stomach, which is totally normal behavior. And Tammy just continued to harass Heather, even though the relationship was ended. Uh, I mean, well, I suppose she's a right to be pissed. Just all around the, around the clock sending just awful, awful messages. This is crazy. Like, she's doing all of this, and they're not even, he's not even dealing with this girl no more. Tammy tried to get Heather fired from her job at the Tilted Kilt, calling the restaurant regularly and telling them her husband would stop repairing their equipment as long as she continued working there, which resulted in Heather losing hours. On November 5th, the last time Heather saw Sydney, well, that we can confirm, Heather retweeted this joke. Hey, Mary fellas, you can either cheat on your wife or... Oh, what? Never both. That's when you get caught. What? And I guess Tammy, oof, she didn't like that. On November 19th, Sydney, Tammy, and their kids, they left South Carolina to go to Disneyland for a vacation. Tammy just loved Mickey Mouse, all that shit. They returned on December 11th. Now around this time, Heather seemed to be doing really well. Seems like she had finally kind of gotten over uh, her relationship with Sydney. She had just gotten a new job working in a beauty parlor. She had started going to church regularly with her uh, best friend and roommate, Brianna. Things were looking up. One thing though, um, she was putting on weight, like baby weight. Co-workers at the Tilted Kilt noted her uniforms had gone up three bra sizes. Heather was concerned she'd become pregnant, possibly by Sydney. Her manager at the Tilted Kilt said she had taken one pregnancy test, which came back as error. Either the pregnancy test was broken or more likely she was gonna have a robot baby. As you can imagine, when the rumors started to spread around and Tammy may have learned of them, oh man, that would just drive her even more crazy. So around this time, around mid-December, uh, Brianna left to go and spend the holidays with her families down in Florida. So Heather was left alone in uh, Carolina. On December 17th, Heather texted Brianna and told her she was going out on a first date with a man she had met named Stephen Chiraldi. All right, so listen up, folks. Now we're going to talk about the night she disappeared, and we'll go through a rough timeline of what happened. Oof. So, according to Brianna, this was Heather's first official date since she ended her relationship with Sydney, and Heather was excited to go. At 10 p.m. that night, he drove her around in his car, looking at residential Christmas lights in the area. They later drove to a parking lot, where he taught her how to drive his manual transmission vehicle, and she sent this picture to her dad. Stephen then dropped Heather off at her apartment at about 1.15 a.m. At 1.19 a.m. that night, or rather that early morning, Sydney was seen on surveillance video at a local Walmart buying a pregnancy test. I wonder for whom. 20 minutes later, a call was placed from a payphone to Heather's cell phone, lasting five minutes. Heather then called Brianna in Florida, saying Sydney had just called. He was planning to leave Tammy and wanted to meet with her. And Brianna said, rightly, don't go to him. What do you do? Uh, apparently, Heather was like extremely upset during this call, as you can imagine. Then, at 2:29 a.m., Heather's phone attempted to call the payphone that Sydney had used, but no answer. It seems then Heather, or at least Heather's phone, was pinged at Longbeard's Bar and Restaurant in Carolina Forest within the next half hour. At 2:57 a.m., her phone headed to Augusta Plantation Drive, but then turns around and she returns to Longbeard's bar. Perhaps she was going somewhere but changed her mind. At 3.16 a.m., Heather's cell phone attempted to call Sydney's cell phone as she was leaving Longbeard's. Got no answer. 
She then went back to her apartment. She tried to call Sydney again, and this time she got an answer. The call lasted about four minutes. Heather at her apartment, Sydney in his own house. Then, at about half 3 a.m., Heather's phone moved to a secluded wooded area at Myrtle Beach called Peachtree Boat Landing. Around this time, a surveillance camera captured a dark colored F-150 coming from the direction of the Moore home, headed towards the boat landing. This was later confirmed to be Sydney's vehicle. At 3.38 a.m., Heather's phone attempted to call Sydney's phone, but there's no answer, and she tried a few times. Then, at 3.42 a.m., no more activity comes from Heather's phone. At 3.47 a.m., the same camera captured a truck coming from the direction of the boat landing and headed back towards the Moorer house. Now, Tammy and Sydney would later claim that they were out that night because they were just banging in their car, you know, going around the secluded parts of Myrtle Beach. And it just so happened to me, what a coincidence, that they were at the same place, Peachtree Boat Landing, that Heather was at the same time she was there in the middle of the night while Heather was alone. Just weird, you know, running into people like this. What are the odds? Yeah. The next morning, Heather's dad, Terry, started to become worried after not hearing from her. He calls the police and they find Heather's car abandoned at Peachtree Boat Landing. They see it's pretty messy inside, but nothing out of the ordinary. And Terry, having an extra set of keys, drives Heather's car home. Kind of uh, destroying any potential evidence or fingerprints, maybe, that could have been in the car. Right. Now, we never see Heather again after this. And I've never really been able to find out much information about Heather's car. If there was more information in it. It's really all we know. So then, as the hours go by, Heather is still nowhere to be found. Still to this day, a missing persons case was opened. Wow. Day 20 in the search for missing 20-year-old Heather Elvis. On Saturday, dozens of cars and horse trailers lined the heavily wooded area around Ronald McNair Boulevard, just off Highway 501 in Myrtle Beach. Groups of volunteers continued to help in the search. Heather's date that night, Stephen Shiraldi, was quickly cleared. A search of the area around the boat landing found no sign, and searches of the riverbed also found nothing. As I said, Stephen and Tammy were questioned, uh, completely like changing their story every time. Oh yeah, I did call her. Oh wait, no, I didn't. Your phone records are bullshit. I have no idea what's going on. Of course. Who's Heather? Never met her. And the search for Heather Elvis would continue. But... Nothing would be found, no leads, no traces of her. Um, when was the last time you talked to her before that three or four minutes? Oh, yeah, probably into October, beginning of November, right in there somewhere. You didn't talk to her? Oh, no. It was like well before, because we went on vacation. It was well before we went on vacation. And there was nothing. The last thing. contact that, or anything? Yeah, there was the last thing that was sent or anything was she sent a period to me, and that was it. And that was through text messages yeah. or phone calls? And I didn't Did she that. normally text or call? Usually it was text. Because yeah. you can delete them a little easier? Or... Well, no, that's just usually the way we talk. Cause... What did your wife find out that that was kind of going on? Well, by the end of October. End of October? Okay. Now, um... and she asked, what do you want to do? With... And I mean, at first I didn't tell her what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, had she ever and... met her? No. Never seen her, never met her? No. And then the following day, I told my wife what was going on, and my wife actually talked to her, and they had planned a meeting. And she didn't show up for the meeting. How'd she start a relationship? Just uh, a couple of the girls that said, "Hey, you know, Heather had a dream about you, like a nasty dream or something." And I'm like, "Okay, good." And you know, I was going about my business, and like two or three times that kind of happened. And then, you know, we just kind of sort of got we would talk a little more every time in person. And mm -hmm. then she started calling me, mm -hmm. um, and I still don't know how she got my phone number, but she started calling me. And this is and around, it kind of led on. You think? Summer. Mid September or something, maybe. Okay. Um, so she started texting or calling in. You could yeah. call her back. I mean, she's a young, pretty girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she was like, He's like, Ooh, wee, I'm look at me. I'm about to hear 40 getting attention from girls half my age. I got to see what's up with this. There was a phone call made to Heather that night from a payphone at the gas station on 10th Avenue. Okay. But we have video. 
from that. Okay. Did you try calling her just a minute? No. A second? You sure? But he he gonna sit here and lie. Start again. I, I did. I called her. From okay, the let, let's okay. start from the start again. Because I, I know. I, I, don't, the, I don't, don't know you. You know what I mean. I, don't I know. know. And the whole story, everything's legit. Okay. okay. Let's go call. back to the part where it's not being legit. It's okay. From the well, no, I didn't call her on the payphone. Okay. And what did you say? I asked her to please leave me alone because she had been leaving notes on her car when I would be. I was at work. To call so, and say leave me alone to a woman. Yes. Who you need to start over. Yeah. Let's start over. This. Is that ain't that ain't that ain't flying, boss. But you don't. You guys don't understand. I had boyfriends. We had a the marriage. Okay. That's okay. I I, I could care less if he had sex with a hundred people. Okay. All right. I mean that doesn't really. It doesn't bother me. So I mean this yeah. girl. I I can tell you just by as an outsider looking at the Twitter, which I didn't know existed until all this went down. She's not right. She's not normal. I was twenty. I I party with bands constantly. I wasn't that kind of girl. And believe me, I had the friends to make me that kind of girl, and I didn't do it. So, there's something not right with her. You know, I'm not assuming that anything happened to this girl. She could be running around with all. That's what I'm thinking, too. She could just be... But yeah. that's, it, Did she say what I think she said? Oh, my Lord, woman. She needs to be hit with a, um, a slap of reality. She doesn't want me to... In February, two months after Heather was last seen, Sydney would file multiple uh, complaints that people were harassing him. He said that people shot at him, his family and his vehicle, and that family pets were mutilated and killed. However, there was no proof of anything happening to the family. Tammy would also take to social media claiming her and her family were being harassed by unknown people. And on her Facebook, she wrote about how corrupt the police in the area are. Then, also in February, police executed a search warrant of the Moore's house. The house it was a mess, and they found quite a lot of guns. They also did get this surveillance footage of Sydney and Tammy cleaning their brand new truck just a few days after Heather disappeared. Interesting. After an 11 hour search, both Sydney and Tammy were arrested and charged with murder, kidnapping, obstruction of justice, and two counts each of indecent exposure. These coming from the sexually explicit images found in her phones that were taken in public places. The obstruction of uh, justice charges were against Sydney for denying using the payphone to call uh, Heather that night. I mean, he I admitted it. Footage of using it. So, so. He admitted it. In early 2015, the couple were released from jail after paying bond. Heather's family, ooh, they weren't best pleased about that because uh, they said they should be kept in jail because they had started to receive like death threats and stuff from the people who supported the Moors claims that they were completely innocent and that there was some kind of conspiracy going on. You see a lot of people in the community actually stuck by Tammy and Sydney due to the way uh, they were able to portray Heather on social media, you know, kind of slandering her saying she was a crazy stalking man stealer of a woman and that they were completely innocent, they were just trying to be a family, and then Heather comes in and then, well, and then, you know, they would say she got what she deserved, that kind of shit. The court required Sydney and Tammy to agree to GPS monitoring of their whereabouts, and to stay five miles away from the Elvis family home at all times, and to avoid interacting with any of them on social media. In September 2015, the court allowed the Moors to move to Florida, where Sydney had found a job while the case was still pending. First, talking about the last day Heather Elvis was seen, a day when he says she left notes on his car at work. So I called her, told her, said, hey, look, I don't know if it's notes, you know, whatever. Enough's enough. Stop calling me. Stop texting me. She says, I don't know why it has to be like this or something like that. And I'm like, look, this, you just need to stop. Lies. It wasn't what you think it was. It was just... Moore says he stopped the relationship months before after his wife Tammy found out. He says Tammy only spoke with Heather on the phone and that conversation was about leaving him. She started talking to her about, hey, will you go to an attorney with me to get a divorce? Um, and she said, sure, no problem. Back to the day Elvis's car was found at Peachtree Landing, Moore says he started receiving phone calls. One from Terry Elvis, Heather's father, the next from detectives. He told them he had talked to Heather the day before, but had not seen her since October. At this point, did you know what 
I didn't like, know oh. exactly. They said that they hadn't heard from her. These fools really get away with this, man. This, dude, come on. You was out there at that lake with this girl. Supposedly you went out there with your wife same time as the girl went out there. By, no, you. I was talking about going out there on the phone. Come on, man. I just can't believe that they're innocent. I, I, I refuse. Call me biased, but what do y'all think? Comment down below. But I had been told by friends and stuff that it happened a lot. I cooperated from the very first time anyone contacted me. I never said, call my attorney. I'm not talking to you. None of that. Uh, do you feel like people know that? No, I don't think they do. When they came and asked to look in our house, we let them look in our house with no warrant. Look around. Do what you want to do. And then, six months later, the charges of murder against Sydney and Tommy were dropped. Why did they drop that murder? Dang, they got away with it. Murder charge against this couple. Hey, good morning, Brad. Well, the media reached out to uh, officials and they couldn't give a comment as to why the charges have been dropped. However, Sydney and Tammy Moore are still being charged with kidnapping. Now, they are connected to the disappearance of Heather Elvis, but police say even though they have never found a body, they still believe that she was killed. And it seemed at the time that was that. Not really, though. You see, a year and three months later, in June 2016, the trial for kidnapping began. This was against Sydney, and during the trial, the jury heard all the dirty details. After deliberating for 11 hours, the jury was hung, 10 to 2, with 10 of them wanting to convict, and 2 not. Now, allegedly, one of the jurors was friends with uh, Sydney's lawyer, so... Anyway, the judge uh, called it a mistrial. Sydney would also continue to spout shite on Facebook. In July 2017, an obstruction of justice trial against the Moors began. This was, well, essentially due to Sydney's early denial about making the payphone calls. And I mean, the reason he had made the calls on the payphone to Heather rather than using his cell phone was that he removed all the cards from his cell phone so he couldn't be tracked. Sydney was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison, the maximum for the offense. In April 2018, a grand jury indicted Sydney and Tammy on a single count of conspiracy to kidnap. As the first trial was a mistrial, essentially it started up again. In October 2018, Tammy went on trial for the charges. After the 11 day trial, the jury convicted Tammy after four hours of deliberations. She was sentenced to 60 years in prison. And then in September 2019, Sidney Moore was convicted in the kidnapping of Heather Elvis, just like his wife. If I can find people plugged her on with Is that him? He looks way different. I mean, anything I tell them would be a lot. It doesn't make it help to get many closure. I understand that children, I get it. It's crazy how long stuff takes to happen like it took five years for them to get convicted there's just nothing i can give them they're closure right. thank you sir i know i know they suffered probably way more than i guess and i'll be mad for them really nothing i can give them bro you can give them your time in jail ha! sorry if i can Wait, what did he get convicted for? How long was he in there? But neither Sydney nor Tammy have ever said what actually happened to Heather Elvis that night. Of course not. Uh, and they both uh, continued to uh, maintain their innocence, saying, never had anything to do with it, don't know what happened to her. And unfortunately, no one has any idea what happened to Heather. There's never been any leads or traces or evidence or anything, really. I mean, we obviously suspect Tammy and Sydney, but who knows? We get back in the back room, and Terry put his hands on my shoulders, and he said, "Now what?" And I said, "Exactly, because this, this is over, but we still haven't found Heather." And it's like I was telling the judge, "There has to be something more." 
There has to be something more that we can hold over their head to make them talk. There's got to be some kind of an incentive. It was so hard to walk out of the courtroom knowing that that might be the last time we get to do anything in that way. It was scary. Alright, now, if y'all saw me counting, I was listening to everything she said, but my my attention was completely drawn onto this girl here. And the reason I was counting is because I noticed something she was doing, and it might have been four and not three. I don't know if she has some type of issue that causes her to do this, but watch her eyes. We get back in the back room. And Terry put his hands on my shoulders and he said, now what? And I said, exactly. That was another one. She'll do these aggressively hard blinks and they get harder and harder. Like, like she's, I dream a genie or something. Cause it's, this is over. Be so you saw that? I don't know why that stood out to me. And it's like I was telling the judge, there has to be something more. There has to be something more that we can hold over their head to make them talk. There's got to be some kind of an incentive. It was so hard to walk out of the courtroom knowing that that might be the last time we get to do anything in that way. I mean, but what what was the sentence for the husband, though? Wife got, she's not getting out. She's not getting out of prison. She, she's already up in age, and she just had 60 years added on top of that. But what about the husband? What did he get? It was scary. Though apparently the Moore's lawyer is filing a lawsuit against the police department, as the defense claim they know what happened and that the wrong people are in jail. Really? I find that highly unlikely. Exactly. Thank you so, so much for watching. Woo! I'm telling y'all, there's so many crazy cases out there that we don't even know about, but luckily we got channels like this. And I'm curious, how does he have this? Is he using like a green screen thing behind him to mask out the background and be black like that, which is really dope? Or is he in a room that's like completely pitch black and he has lights direction in such a way that they don't illuminate whatever this black space is back here? I'm like freaking confused. I want to know how he's doing this. But anyway, y'all know what time it is. Like this reaction, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more. As always, the link to the video is going to be down in the description box below if you haven't already. Make sure you follow your boy where? On the gram and Twitter. At Artie Kicks. And I'm going to catch you guys in the next one. See ya. Be safe.